What a blessing tonight to uh, be able to let's see. I might have to go like this to be able to hear Chad's report. Uh, there aren't very many people that would uh, so boldly enter such a secular society and be so creative. Uh, you know, I've been a church missions report listener for 56 years, right? All of you that go to church, and uh, it was just so refreshing to see all the levels of penetration and what a joy that is that the Lord is at work. Well, while we were in Rome, um, I got a series of, of uh, questions uh, in email, and they were so interesting to me that I began working on them uh, as I was, you know, all we do is have Bible studies. I, I told you we had I believe uh, that I spoke 72 times in two weeks, and so I was just constantly studying. And here are the three questions uh, that that, uh, were sent to me, and and these are just, uh, I get these all the time, and I haven't forgotten the tattoo and cigar smoking one. That's coming in a couple weeks. Uh, I forget, tattoos, cigars, and something else exciting. Um, But since that's already slated, I thought that this email was fascinating. What are the differences between Hades, hell, the grave, and the pit? Uh, That was because this is, uh, I forget who it is, but they were uh, relatively new here, and I can't remember, I think relatively new Christian, they're reading the Bible. And as they read the Bible, they're they're seeing all of these, um, you know, references, and, and it's fascinating. And so, what I, how I think, I always think of verses, you know, um, in the Bible, in 1 Samuel 28 is a reference to Samuel coming out of the earth, you know, coming up out of the earth. And Ezekiel 31 and 32 actually mix both of those, the Hades and the pit. And then Luke 16, <clears throat> excuse me, is the rich man and Lazarus, and he is down in that same place. And then Revelation 20 is the The finale. So that was the first question. The next one, come on, I'm not supposed to talk to you. There we go. Uh, So how come I don't have, I'm sorry, Dan, how come I don't have all three questions? Here we go. Here we go. That was the first question. I was just in the wrong place. Uh, The second question that came, which fascinating, um, again, Calvary Bible Church is a cessationist church. You all know that. We're creationist, cessationist, imputationist. I mean, lots of big biblical doctrinal things. But the, the flat-out question was, are sign gifts over? The answer is no, they're not, if you read the Bible. But do we believe that currently there are people that have the gift of healing, the gift of, you know, giving revelation directly from God, speaking through the Holy Spirit in uh, unlearned languages. And so that was a fascinating question. And uh, so, again, um, the only place the sign gift of tongues, that particular one is talked about is in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. But the greater sign gift uh, passage is Joel chapter 2. So we'll, we'll go through that. And then, this was fascinating. And, and I remember this was our study last summer uh, when we did Hebrews. Uh, but again, uh, somebody was still cogitating on that. And who was Melchizedek? You know, that's the Hebrews 7 um, reference that was in our Bible study. And what they, they just asked who he was. And I said, well, the top three candidates are Shem, Jesus, or some pagan king. And so those are our three questions tonight. So the first one, and, and if you want to open your Bibles, I just want to show you um, 1 Samuel 28, because, uh, and I will pause between each of these questions to make sure I answered what, whatever it was you were wanting to know. But I love these questions because I love to demonstrate to you uh, the way that that you can string together what the Bible says and, and get uh, kind of like a survey of, so you know you're in the ballpark. So um, as you read the Bible, you notice these interchangeable terms for the afterlife, uh, especially for what, what's amazing is that um, both the saved and the lost appear to go to the same place in the Old Testament. But it's not until the New Testament that we see that there's a differentiation between them. So real quickly, uh, what are the differences? First Samuel 28, that's Samuel and the witch of uh, Endor. 
And uh, Friday, we drove by Endor. It's still a place. In fact, it's a kibbutz. Uh, it's uh, the hill of Moray goes like this in the Jezreel Valley, and it's perched right on the side. And the biblical place where Saul went, you know, dressed up as a peasant, is, is a tell. And a tell is an artificial mound where an old city was. And for the last 30 years, there have been five palm trees on top of it. So if you uh, drive around Israel on Route 65, you'll see the actual spot. You know, everything in the Bible are literal historic events. Um, and there are real places that back these up. But if you look at 1 Samuel 28, starting in verse 3, Saul is consulting a medium. Do you remember what it was? Saul was the king. God commissioned him, gave him all the, the power of leading his people. He gave him a new heart. It actually says he had a different heart as he started his kingship. And then the Lord gave him some opportunities to obey, and he didn't do very well. You all know the stories from Sunday school that God told him to, to kill all the Amalekites, and he not only doesn't kill all the Amalekites, he spares the best. And the Lord then says that the kingdom is not going to be yours anymore because the kingdom of ruling over my people Israel is only for someone to obey me. And the classic verse, hath not the Lord uh, required obedience for to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of lambs. But so what happens is the Lord backs off and kind of departs from Saul. So Saul is facing the Philistines and the Philistines are just like locusts, there's so many of them, and he gets scared. And so he says, I need to consult with the Lord, he won't talk to me, so I'm going to go to someone else that can get into the spirit world, a witch. And there's only one left, because he got rid of them all. So that's the story. But watch what happens, this witch, and this is a very insightful, uh, verse 6, when Saul inquired of the Lord, I'm in 1 Samuel 28, 6, the Lord didn't answer him, either by dreams or by the Urim, or by the prophets. The Urim and the Thummim, you know, it's the, the little uh, part of the priest outfit that they had this uh, little box that had a way, it's almost like uh, casting lots, that you could tell an answer from the Lord. None of those. Samuel wouldn't talk to him, the Lord wouldn't speak to him in a dream, and he couldn't get the priest to help him. And so, um, the, the woman, verse 11, said, Whom shall I bring up for you? It was interesting, Chad, talking about the tarot cards. I mean, to many people in the world, they do this. This is a seance. Seances are real, and so are Ouija boards and tarot cards and palm readers and everybody else. It is occultic. It, cult means worship, and the off-worship, the other worship, because there's only two sources of power in this world, God and not God. Cult, worship, God. Occult, not God worship, and that's the devil. So if you're not in step with this, the word of God, everything else is of the devil, including Islam, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, all the errors. It's not of God. And so occultic tarot cards, you know, crystal balls, all that stuff is where Satan's at work. And what's amazing, I told you this morning, going through the old city of Jerusalem, I saw how many of those Muslim kids were doing killing games. Remember, Satan came to kill and steal and destroy. And so much of the entertainment media that young people feast on these days is killing and stealing and destroying. And that is an avenue through which the devil comes. But this woman, an avenue to the spirit world, uh, Saul says, King Saul says, bring up Samuel for me. Now watch this. See, occultic people, seance people, Edgar Casey's and Jeannie Dixon's and any practicing seancer, if they're, if they're good at it, they know they're working with demons and demons can impersonate anyone. I mean, you can bring up Joan of Arc, you can just call for anybody and they'll come because demons, daimon, Greek word intelligence, demon is just a Greek word, the Greek word means intelligence. So a demon is an intelligent spirit that is immortal that has lived for thousands of years, has been everywhere, knows every human language, has met 60 generations of people. Okay, so I mean, we're talking about something fascinatingly huge. The occult is fascinating, and it is huge, and it's deadly. So this woman is used to the demons, and so she calls out for the demon to impersonate Samuel, 
And she cries out with a loud voice, and the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, Now look at verse 13. This is fascinating. I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. See, this isn't what normally happened. See, this woman was used to this. She was paid. She was a professional seancer having demons who would know things no one else would know. A demon is invisible. It can travel through anywhere. It, it, I mean, it could go listen to the Philistines and tell you what the Philistines says and impersonate a Philistine. I mean, demons are very, very powerful. And so she was used to. She was just going to have a demon impersonate Samuel. And all of a sudden, a spirit ascended out of the earth, verse 14. So he said to her, what is his form? And she said, he's an old man coming up. He's covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived it was Samuel. And he stooped and bowed his face to the ground and bowed bowed down. What is going on here? This woman screams because she didn't get the demon. She got a real person. And this real person comes up from somewhere below on the earth. And that's, that should start making our wheels turn because something's going on here. And Samuel said to Saul, verse 15. Now it doesn't say a demon impersonating Samuel. It doesn't say a figment of the witch of Endor's imagination. It was really Samuel. Samuel came back from the grave. He ascends from below. So that's very fascinating. Uh, the pit is the, or this Hades or whatever, is the abode of all the dead. In the Old Testament, they all were in the same place. And, and a lot of us, uh, we, we haven't really ever thought about that. In fact, on this trip, I was talking with someone that, uh, uh, that I was spending time with and was asking questions about the scripture. I said, did you know that everyone that's ever lived in the history of this world is still alive and they're still here on earth? They're not off somewhere. You know, people go out at night and they wonder, where is heaven? You know, where, where is all that happening? The dead don't leave. They're here. They're endlessly alive, and they're still here. And the Bible tells us where. So if you go to Ezekiel 32, actually we'll start in Ezekiel 31. But um, Ezekiel 31 and 32 uh, are very significant for us to understand because it ties together. So keep going past 1 Samuel and the Psalms and Jeremiah, and right after Jeremiah is Ezekiel. And look at 31, and I'll just uh, start, start in verse 14. Now, Ezekiel's not uh, like Philippians, where people are all the time. Ezekiel's kind of one of those books you kind of take a deep breath and read fast, you know, uh, to get through it, because there's so many things that we don't understand. And, And a lot of times the reason we don't understand them is that we haven't decided we want to. I always remember what uh, uh, Warren Wearsby said. He said he wanted to understand every word of the Bible. And he spent his life asking the Lord to help him to understand every word of the Bible. And really, uh, if we have that kind of an attitude, the Lord, uh, just like people love to share their hobby with you, how much more does the God of the universe want us to understand the Bible? And so that's part of it. But repetitive reading helps. But, but look at verse 14. And this is just picking up right in the middle. Uh, Ezekiel... Uh, is doing a series of warnings. It's doom and gloom. It's the decline. Ezekiel was a priest. He was carried off to Babylon. You all know the, the, about him. But look what he starts saying in verse 14. Um, he says, So the trees, no water may ever be given to exalt themselves for their height and set the tops among the thick boughs. No tree which drinks water may ever be high enough to reach up to them. I mean, that's interesting. I mean, you, you read it and you wonder, what does that mean? And then he keeps going. Now, this this starts getting interesting. Middle of verse 14 of Ezekiel 31. For they have all been delivered to death, to the depths of the what? What does it say? So it equates death with the depths of the earth. And then it continues, among the children of men who go down to the what? The pit. The pit. Now we have, uh, we had Samuel uh, coming from below. Now, Ezekiel is telling us there is something called the pit. And he, he specifically says it's in the depths of the earth and the children of men, that means humans, go there. So that's interesting. Uh, by the way, the, the word, the, the Hebrew word is just uh, the word boar. Um, uh, this... Uh, Below, it's just the, the preposition, but, but actually, it's just three B, W, and R in Hebrew. 
uh, which would be boor. And uh, that's, that's the, the word for pit, but it's often in the Bible. It's, it's 65 times in the Bible, but here, here comes more. Look at verse 15. Thus says the Lord God, in the day when it went down to hell. Now we have a second word that is very big. Now this one you've all heard of. This is Sheol, if you've ever heard of that word. And this word is 65 times in the Bible. And this word is 65 times. And this word is most often translated grave. But here it has, for some reason, at least in the New King James, it's translated hell. But what is amazing is, it, it says that the, the, they're, they're kind of synonymous. Sheol, the grave, bore the pit. And then look at verse 16. Uh, I made the nation shake at the sound of its fall. I will cast down to hell, that's to Sheol again, together those who descend into the pit, that's Bur again, and all the trees of Eden. That's an interesting. All the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all the drink water were comforted in the depths of the earth. Again, every time we're talking about the grave and the pit, and Hades, it's always here, and it's always down, and it's always in the earth. And it picks up again if you go to 32 and go across. Now it's talking about an actual nation that God is judging, and people are dying, and, and soldiers are dying in literal battles that are going on. In verse 17, it came to pass in the 12th year, on the 15th day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me. So, so Ezekiel, the Lord's prophet, is getting a direct revelation from God. God is talking to him, and he says, Son of man, that's the usual way God describes Ezekiel, wail over the multitudes of Egypt and cast them down to the depths of the earth. Continuing reading in verse 18, her daughters, the famous nations, with those who go down to the what? There it is again. And, and he's starting to talk about a, a time of death and destruction and, and judgment upon the literal nation. Now this is the 7th century B.C., and this is when Egypt is in its decline. Uh, and, and there are battles, and the Assyrians are ascending, and the Babylonians are coming, and, and there's a lot of fighting. Keep reading down in verse uh, 22. Assyria is there and all her company, with their graves all around her. So we're, we're talking about this pit, and the word Sheol is in verse 21, in the midst of hell. Um, and her company is around her, verse 23 says, and all the slain fallen by the sword who caused terror in the land of the living. So what it's saying is that there's kind of like uh, the above ground, the below ground. And when they're above ground and alive, they're fighting up here. And when they're dying, they go down below the ground to whatever designation uh, the Lord chooses to use in a particular time. But it's always when they die... They're going here on earth somewhere that the Lord has designated. And look at verse 23. Her graves are set in the recesses of the pit. So it's like there are, there are little nests. Verse 24. There is Elam. Now we're over in Persia. This is Media, Parthia, Persia. This Elam, the Elamites over there that are still in existence. Um, the the nationalities in the geographic area and all her multitudes all around her grave sheol all them slain and fallen by the sword they have gone down uncircumcised to the lower parts of the earth now this is very similar to when we're in revelation 20. revelation 20 says five times a thousand years a thousand years a thousand years a thousand years and a thousand years and people say what are what that means because they, they don't want to accept the fact it means a thousand years. But see, the best way to understand, for the Bible to make sense when you read it, the very first thing we should believe is whatever it says is what it means. Unless there's a, a strong, compelling reason not to think it means what it says. Like, like he's talking in figurative terms. Now, this is figurative terms in some sense, but he's stringing together this continual concept of death, grave, pit, being on earth, lower parts, people going there. And so, verse 24 says, who caused terror in the land of the living? These people who were the big warlords, you know, the kind of like the Somali warlord, you know, that, that are right now uh, causing havoc over in northern Africa. These, these who cause people terror in the land of the living, now they bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. 
So basically, what the second reference is, the abode of the dead, God calls the pit, all the dead. In 1 Samuel, righteous Samuel was there. And he actually, God allowed him to come up and talk to Saul, and he goes back down. And it scared the witch, because it wasn't a demon that she was used to dealing with. Okay, now the next one, let's look at Luke 16. Now we get into Jesus telling uh, one of his many unbelievable stories. I mean, his stories were so communicative. He was a master storyteller. And there's nothing wrong with stories. Uh, Jesus told stories of sowers and seeds and everything else, but this one has names. And so that's why we don't think that this is a parabolic story where you know, the, the servants are unnamed and they're given talents and all that, which aren't literal people. He's kind of giving a picture of a concept. But here all of a sudden in Luke 16, if you want to start in verse 19, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. By the way, you might have heard of uh, this man called Dives. Uh, that's the word for a rich man. But in Luke 16, what we see uh, that there are these two people, a certain beggar, but this is the only parable where the person in the story has a name, so it's probably not a parable. Jesus now is actually telling an event only he would know about. This, this faceless beggar that he knew was named, named Lazarus, and this rich man dies, uh, whatever his real name was, and and. They are, are both living, verse 20, he's full of sores, Lazarus is laid in his gate. He desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, verse 21. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. This is very graphic. So it was, the beggar died. So Lazarus dies, and look at what happens to the righteous at the instant of death. Remember, uh, the Lord uh, talks about his angels, will watch over you, you know, and, and he, Jesus claims that. Uh, when, when he's discussing and he clarifies that with the devil about the fact that the angels are very involved with our lives. Well, the angels carried this rich man to some place called Abraham's bosom. That's a fascinating concept, whatever that is. Um, but if you notice in verse 22, only his body dies. He's still conscious, just like we saw right here. Those people and I didn't read the whole Ezekiel 31 and 32, but those people from Elam and Assyria and everywhere else were conscious. Do you know the only thing that dies is our body? We are immortal souls. We are endlessly existing. That's a part of the image of God. He has given to us immortality, just like angels are indestructible and immortal. Uh, un unbelievable to think of that. We're so frail. But what we see is that only his body, uh, uh, both of these die, but the rich man, verse 22, also dies and is buried. So what's interesting is the righteous go to, to what we're going to see as bliss, and the unrighteous go to this awful recesses of the pit. Um, keep reading, verse 23, and being in torments in Hades, there's Hades, Sheol, same place, Boor, Sheol, grave, uh, don't be confused with the word we're coming to later, Gehenna, but because nobody's in hell right now, literal hell, nobody, it's empty. But this word hell is sometimes used by translators, and we need to be cautious because it's not talking about Gehenna, it's talking about the grave, Sheol, Boor, all this place. But being in torments in Hades, Sheol, the grave, the rich man lifts up his eyes and saw. So, wow. After death, we still have the sensation of feeling. He's in torments. He's having pain. Our senses are intact. We can see. He saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now all of a sudden we see that at this particular time, Jesus seems to imply that the grave has two parts. I call it the happy side, uh, you know. The happy side of Hades, which is um, Abraham's bosom, and the unhappy side, which is fire, torment. Um, it's not hell. Why? Because people can see, and people are standing. Hell is later described as a 
bottomless pit in the blackness of darkness. So you're endlessly tumbling, endlessly falling. Do you ever, have you ever fell a little bit? And it's a very unsettling feeling to have, to be falling. Can you imagine be forever falling? That feeling and still having your senses? I mean, you always, you know, when you're falling, you're just waiting to what? Hit. And so you have that apprehension of hitting. And to be in the dark, there's nothing like walking in the dark and you feel you're gonna step on something or you're gonna run into something or something's gonna get you. And then to be in, in the, the torment of fire, it's very graphic. So verse 24, he cried out. So there's communication. And we find that here, that what we don't realize is these people that are below us on earth somewhere in this place God calls the pit and Sheol and the grave in Hades, that, that we're seeing here are communicating. And, and, but you can in hell, in Gehenna, there's no communication down there. And so, uh, but this guy is, is not yet there, so he's communicating. Verse 24, he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Father Abraham? There's spiritual intuition, too. Jesus is talking about a contemporary beggar that's in the sometime around Christ's life that had died. He's, that's the context. And he knows this rich man, someone that lived 2,100 years before, and he recognizes him. You see, once you cross the line into the spirit world and into out of life as we know it and go to the pit, Sheol, the happier and happy side, all of a sudden you start knowing things you never knew on earth. There's spiritual intuition that says, fascinating. I mean, I could go on this all night, but you always say I never do more than one question, so I'm going to finish it quick. Uh, and, and have mercy on me, send Lazarus, he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. My tongue? You know what that means? Not only our physical senses, sight, feeling, but physical desires are still present and they are amplified when they get to the next stop. If they are lost and they go into eternity, physical desires keep growing. Only they're never satisfied down there. Do you know what it's like to not have something you want like hunger or thirst or what people are driven to do for drugs? Uh, so can you imagine forever being in a place where there's unrequited, unremitted desire? That's, that's why when I address young people, I tell them to be careful what you get as a habit, because habit, sin, is like a reptile. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger the longer you feed it. And it just keeps going in eternity. So his tongue, his, his desires, his physical desires persist, and they're... they're growing and he was tormented in the flame but Abraham now you can talk both ways there's able to talk between the happy side and the unhappy side verse 25 Abraham said son remember oh in the grave you remember life uh, there was a in the news this week there was a, a young person that took the bath salts whatever it is that new drug you know that everybody's going crazy and doing horrible things and he took it and it was bothering him so much that to make him stop having the hallucinations, he shot himself, killed himself, committed suicide um, with a gun. And you know what? He thought that that would end. But look, Abraham, rem son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things and Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. Your painful memories don't go away. You keep them, and they stay with you forever. It's, it's um, awful to think of the implications of what this is saying. Um, the, the happy side, it says in verse 25, you're comforted, you have bliss. This is before the cross. The unhappy side, you're uncomfortable, and you have torment. And this is not hell. This is just the waiting room for hell. Verse 26, besides this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed. So there are boundaries in this place. You can't, you can't go wherever you want to go. So that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, that means you're beyond help. See, I think that's probably the worst thing about hell, and even the waiting room of hell. 
that you all of a sudden realize you can't get out. Reminds me of a, you know, a horror movie or something. Um, and you are tormented uh, and, and, and you can't pass. But look at verse 27. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. Now this is the rich man from here saying, would you, would you please send someone up here to the living and I have rich family members that are still alive. Would you send someone, this guy is communicating across to this side and saying, send someone up there. Look at verse 27. Send him to my father's house. I have five brothers that he may testify to them lest they also come to this place of torment. You know what? That shows the inspiration of the Bible. Did you know what we would write? If we were writing this, we'd say, they deserve it. Let them come. You know what? When you're there, it's so horrible. Even in your fallen sinful state, you can't imagine anybody else coming. Did you know there's a voice from the grave? You know what the voice from the grave is? This guy. And the voice from the grave says, it's so bad here, don't come. It's very interesting. This is a very sobering passage. And Abraham, verse 29, said to him, they have, now we have another interesting part of, of intuition or whatever it is you have down there in the spirit world. Uh, Abraham lived 2100 BC. Moses lived 1400 BC. The prophets lived all the way to 400 BC. This one, Abraham, in the happy side, knows about Moses and the prophets. So there seems to be communication, keeping in touch, uh, knowing what's going on, just like we see in Revelation, that the saints in heaven know the general events going on on earth. So the Lord somehow is keeping everybody informed. So Abraham knows about Moses, knows the prophets, and says, what is more powerful than sending someone back from the grave, like Samuel came back to talk to Saul, you know what's more powerful than, than an apparition from the grave? The Bible. Did you hear what Chad said in his report tonight? He said they try and get them in these Bible studies because they have the most success when people are interacting with the, the Word. It's very true. They have, verse 29, Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. You know what that's talking about? The power of God's Word. Let people hear the Bible. In fact, if you only get a short time to witness people, don't tell them lots of personal stories. Give them the scripture. It's the sword of the spirit. And verse 31, but he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Salvation comes by hearing the word of God. So real quickly, uh, what we found is that the righteous and unrighteous both go down someplace. Ezekiel calls it interchangeably the pit, Sheol, the grave, um, which is translated sometimes hell, Jesus clarifies that it has two parts. There's a happy side and an unhappy side. Jude then starts describing, and if you want to turn with me to Jude, um, and we'll be done with this question, I hope to get to the next one real quick, but you shouldn't ask such hard questions if you want them to be short. That is a long, I mean, that was a lot of stuff. Hades, hell, the grave, and the pit. Uh, but look what Jude says. Um, verse 7 Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in similar matter like these have given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh. That was last month's question. God has forever been opposed to sodomy and immorality and everything else. And he hasn't changed in the New Testament, even though Barney Frank did marry his boyfriend, you know, our great Senate or great representative from Massachusetts. It's still sin, even if you marry him. It's still sexual immorality. But look what it says. Our set forth is an example, verse 7, suffering the vengeance. And now Jude is starting to describe the eternal state. Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude, Jude, do you know who Jude was? Jude was the earthly brother of Jesus Christ. Jesus had four brothers. Two of them write books of the Bible, James and Jude. And these were children of Joseph and Mary that Jesus was not. He was virgin born, but, he, but Mary and Joseph had four sons and three daughters. And, and so this brother 
earthly brother of Christ, inspired by the Holy Spirit, tells us that there's eternal fire, but it doesn't stop there. Keep going. I can find it. A little bit later, it says uh, that they suffer the blackness of darkness forever. Oh, there it is, verse 13. He's talking about apostates now, people that deny uh, the, the deity of Christ and the doctrine of the atonement, and substitutionary atonement. He calls them raging ways of the sea, Jude verse 13, foaming up their own shame. That's a quote from Isaiah. Remember, Isaiah said the wicked are like the restless sea. They're always foaming up, uh, you know, their filth. Foaming up uh, their own shame. Wandering stars. That's a fascinating word. That's, that's the word Planetes. In the ancient world, when they used to look at the sky, they saw stars, you know, the white dots, and then they saw moving stars. And the word planetes means to wander. And planets, that's where we get the word planet, from the word wanderer, because planets wandered. They moved across the sky, and the other stars always stayed in the same place. They kept going around in the seasons, but they always were in the, in the constellations, stayed the same. But, but some of the stars wandered. And so that's the word planetes that, that we get the word planet from. But it says that these are wanderers. They don't stay fixed to doctrine. That's why doctrine is so important, even though many people today say, oh, don't get into doctrine, it's so divisive. No, it clarifies. And these don't like doctrine. They wander from doctrine. They're wandering stars. Now look at this. Here's, here's the second description of hell. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Hell isn't like Hades, the grave, the pit, Sheol, and all that, where they're talking, seeing stuff. It's the vengeance of eternal fire. Now we're not going to worry about what kind of fire has no light. Well, black holes where gravity is so strong that it sucks in the matter and the energy and the gravity implodes upon itself. It's no light, so that could be part of it, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if physics can describe it. God told us that it's eternal fire that is the blackness of darkness. And then quickly to Revelation 20, and, oh, good, we'll be done with one question. Uh, Revelation 20, and let me get to the next slide. I'll just summarize this. Sheol, 65 times, called the grave in the Old Testament, in Ezekiel 31 and 32, describes that. The pit is 65 times. In the Old Testament, it's called the abode of the dead. Ezekiel 31 and 32 puts those two words together. So we're talking about the same thing. Hades is 11 times in the New Testament. It's called the grave, which is is equated with the same thing Luke 16 talks about it. Gehenna, we'll go to in a minute, uh, is Jesus 12 times. In fact, Gehenna is talking about more than heaven. Jesus talks more about this place than he does heaven. Um, but Gehenna is hell. Mark 9 says it's yet future and it's eternal. And Revelation, and that's where we are now, Revelation describes it if you back up in Revelation 19, verse 20, I told you nobody's in hell yet. Gehenna, the lake of fire. The first occupants are in verse 20. The beast, that's this global ruler that is so eloquent and, and conquers the world um, with peace, the white horse, all that that we're coming to on Sunday mornings. The beast is captured with him, the false prophet who works signs in his presence. So. Uh, there's going to be a, an outbreak of miraculous power at the end of days where this guy can call down fire from heaven, literal fire from heaven. Can you imagine the power of a global leader, someone in Europe that steps from the stage and they go, and it, lightning strikes. And they go, you thought that was an accident? And they'll do it again. And they can call down fire from heaven. That Satan, remember Job? Satan sent lightning. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. Satan is very involved in weather. He tried to drown Jesus Christ in the boat on the Sea of Galilee. Satan can alter weather. He can cause lightning. We have no concept of how powerful angels are, fallen and unfallen. So when there are storms, it's great to entrust yourself to the care of the one who is greater. He that is in us is greater than he that is in this world doing all that. But this miracle worker, this false prophet can call down fire. He does all these signs. Um, 
by which he deceived those, verse 20 I'm reading in Revelation 19, who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image, these two were cast alive into, and here's the first time it's referred to, the lake of fire. Five times that lake of fire occurs in this, once here and four more times in the next two chapters. Burning with brimstone. So it, it has this, uh, what, what I showed you back here, this eternal fire, blackness of darkness. It, it's equating this fire and brimstone, it's, but it's still a black place. So uh, keep going um, through to verse um, 10. And the devil who deceived them, this is chapter 20, verse 10, the devil who deceived them was also cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where they'll be tormented forever and ever. And so now we're just talking about the, the lake of fire. And then, verse 13, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, death and Hades. Hades, right here, Sheol, Hades, the, the grave, the pit, all of these things are, are synonymous in the scripture. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, and death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Okay, last word we have to look at. Turn to Mark 9, and uh, we'll tie this off, and I'll, we'll go into overtime. They went into overtime in the World Cup, didn't they? We can go into overtime. No, not really. Uh, Mark 9. Isn't this fascinating? This, did you know, this is what I do all day long. I, I study and pull together scriptures, and I enjoy it so much, and I can't believe that you come on a Sunday night to do it with me. But look at verse 42. Jesus said, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck, and you were thrown into the sea. That is a very sober verse. Uh, to not offend a little one who believes in him. But verse 43, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. You know what that means? Jesus advocated taking radical measures when sin is starting to take hold in our lives. Radical measures. Now, it doesn't mean self-mutilation. What it means is, if you're addicted to pornography, you ought to cancel your internet subscription or turn your, tele your computer around, etc. Take <coughs> radical measures, what he's saying. Whatever it takes. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into maim than having two hands and go to, and here's Jesus describing this place. This is where he talks most about it. Uh, Twelve times he talks about it, and five of them are here. And go to hell. This is the word Gehenna. And what Gehenna means is, uh, from the Hinnom Valley, the Hinnom Valley in Jerusalem was the garbage dump of Jerusalem. It's it, the dung gate, it's called. And they would push the old donkey that died over the edge and it'd go down and tumble down and fall at the bottom. And it, down there would be all their trash that was burning. There were people lighting their trash and it would be burning down there and dead animals and, and anything else that would go down there. And it smoldered and there were worms. And it smelled and it was horrible. And everybody, when Jesus said like Hinnom. By the way, that's where Molech and where they burned the babies, the, the sacrifice of babies. It was just a place of undescribable, ah, nobody wanted to be there. And Jesus said, then having two hands, verse 43, and go to hell, into the fire that will never be quenched, where their worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. Wow. Verse 45, if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame. Now, there's something interesting here. Enter life. You know what Jesus says? What we're going through right now is nothing compared to what we're going to. He says, you're not even really alive right now. Physical world is nothing compared to entering life. Eternal life is amazing. If there's any part of this life you like, it is so much better in the one to come. That's what I was talking about this morning. We are supposed to set our affections on things above. I mean, if you like, if you like collecting stuff here on earth, can you imagine collecting stuff in heaven that will never get ruined or stolen or rust? And if you like going places on earth, it, can you imagine what it will be like in heaven where you won't have you know, airplanes that the air conditioning doesn't work and they're on strike and you, know, you miss your flight? Everything that's good on earth is better in heaven. And what Jesus said is life is yet to come. But, but look at this. And, and be cast into hell. That's Revelation 20 terms. Cast into hell. Where the fire shall never be quenched. Where the worm doesn't die. And where the fire is not quenched. And he says the same thing. So basically, 
to answer the question that someone asked, um, uh, and let's go back to the original question. Come on. Um, the original question was, is there a difference between uh, Hades, yes, that's where people die and go. Hell, nobody's there yet. That's blackness of darkness forever. The grave, yeah, that's where everybody goes. And the pit, that's where everybody goes. What happened? Jesus took the happy side to heaven uh, after the cross, and we could talk about that. Okay, I promised you I'd do one more, so I'll just do one more, and I'll just tell you the answer to it. Our sign gives over. No, they're not. And Joel tells us they're coming around in the tribulation. Okay, and 1 Corinthians 12, basically, uh, there are four periods of miracles, the time of Moses, the birth of the nation, the time of Elijah, the apostasy of the nation, the time of Christ, when the Messiah came, and the time of the apostles, the birth of the church. So, tongues, tongues is only seen at Pentecost, at the conversion of the Gentiles, and when Old Testament saints came, and in Corinth, nowhere else. You don't find tongues. Any other church mentioned. It's not in any of the gift lists. Uh, Romans 12 doesn't have tongues, neither does 1 Peter 4. No apostle but Paul is reported ever even speaking in tongues after Pentecost. I mean, why isn't John speaking in tongues? How come Peter is? Why is it only Paul? It's fascinating to think about with all the emphasis on it today. And no post-apostolic global evangelical church leader in history is ever seen speaking in tongues. Have you ever heard of Billy Graham speaking in tongues? How about Martin Luther? How about anybody? that has been globally an evangelical. So what I'm saying is this, that, that um, uh, sign gifts were for, sign gifts were for specific moments, like the birth of the church, like the birth of Israel, like the time of introducing the Messiah, and like his coming, the end of everything, Joel 2. And so today, the Bible says there is no one that has the gift of healing. There's no one alive that can walk into a hospital and their shadow crossing people can heal them like the apostles had. Like Jesus that says, you can be healed 46 miles away. Nobody has that gift. Those were sign gifts. And uh, if someone asks that, I'll talk about it more and we'll do Melchizedek later. Let's all stand before anybody faints, okay? And um, sorry I didn't let you ask a question, but you asked too many questions and I answered them. It took too long. So, uh, but let's just thank the Lord for his truth. <laughs> Father, we thank you tonight that because we know Jesus Christ, because he took our place, we will never experience the pains of the grave and the fires of hell. Thank you that you, God, treated Jesus like he committed every sin I ever committed. And imputation means you treat me like I lived Christ's perfect life. And that exchange is beyond anything we deserve or can even comprehend, but it's the gospel message that Chad and Kimberly are going into France to share, and we get to go into Kalamazoo, and anywhere else we go and share. And I pray that we would share the word of God that is quick and alive, and it's able to be engrafted and change people's souls and to take away our guilt and our eternal punishment and put it all on Christ and to give us the end of anxiety and the beginning of, of life. We have endless life, and I pray we would live that way, and I pray that we would understand your word and understand that people are consciously suffering right now in the pit, and their minds are remembering, and I pray that they wouldn't remember that they live next door to us and we never walked across the street to tell them about you. I pray that we'd go into all the world and share the good news and be doing what you left us to do. For your glory, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you as you go.